But let's move on now uh, to the companies themselves as we sort of dive into the whole uh, uh, commercial life science world with Neil Clark, who's the chief at uh, Destiny Pharma. And this is a clinical stage company on AIM, as all our companies are. They had their IPO in 2017, focusing on something for which uh, uh, well, we've already heard tonight, there's a desperate need, innovative drugs addressing antibiotic resistance. Uh, Neil's chief executive qualified as an accountant with PwC in Cambridge, but unlike most uh, of, uh, of that breed, he also has a BSc in bioscience, an impressive track record uh, bringing biotech uh, drug businesses to market. So over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, here to talk about destiny. So I think we've got sort of 15, 18 minutes. So uh, I will move through the slides. Uh, and as was introduced, destiny is focused on um, developing new anti-infectives. We try not to use the word antibiotics because it comes with certain baggage, which we'll refer to later in the presentation. But um, every time I come to London and get off at Paddington, I've walked past uh, the plaque for Alexander Fleming, the inventor of penicillin, of course, in 19. Uh, 1940s, um, but straight away when penicillin was used, resistance was seen, and uh, as, as was noted, uh, the problem with uh, uh, drugs in this area, new drugs, is that, that are desperately needed, is they do need to address the problem of uh, the superbugs and, and resistance, and, and we do. Destiny uh, has been set up to address that. So, moving on, we listed in uh, 2017... Um, uh, our board, originally our chairman was Sir Nigel Rudd, but recently Nick Rogers has joined us, who was chairman of Oxford Biomedica and a healthcare banker. Uh, myself and others have got experience uh, in private and uh, public companies. And I'd note that our founder, Dr. Bill Love, founded the company 20 years ago, ex Novartis scientist, has, has spent a couple of decades working in this space, um, developing new anti-infectives, and, and was the inventor of the XF platform, which is, which is our invention. So it's not... Um, it's not an old formulation that we're revisiting. It's not in license from pharma. This is an invention um, down in Sussex from Bill and the team. So um, our sort of strap line, prevention is better than cure, which I think people can understand uh, is a great benefit to, uh, to patients and payers alike, trying to avoid with our lead asset uh, costly hospital infections. Um, and this is a well-established uh, path for, for many drugs, but of course in the area of, of, of infection prevention uh, makes great sense. And we have a lead asset which is looking to prevent hospital infections. And in the UK, we're, we're well aware um, of, of MRSA, which uh, perhaps a decade ago was, was really a, quite a hot political issue with the hospital wards being shut down um, due to this infection, which is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcal aureus. So Staph aureus is one of the one of the sort of the top 12 nasty bugs which are listed on the WHO uh, website. So we're looking to address infections caused by uh, staph aureus in hospitals. Uh, next to 73, our lead asset is in phase two, so we're recruiting patients now, and uh, we're looking for that, that study to complete and then hopefully go into phase threes. Um, yeah, so we own the XF platform. Uh, it has big potential, driven by its use, we believe, in the increasing number of hospital procedures uh, associated with many of the uh, indications, perhaps we talked about earlier, oncology uh, and other diseases, there's often a hospital procedure, and many of these procedures expose the patient, which could be any of us, of course, to, to the potential for uh, an infection. So obviously, if you can prevent those infections, you can potentially help a large number of patients, which, which with sensible pricing, can lead, of course, to very big market opportunity. We also have an earlier pipeline, uh, we have a China partner, and also we have a good cash position. So we are small, uh, but following the IPO and also a, a partnering deal we did uh, in China with China Medical Systems, we have cash through to late 2020, even probably early 2021, um, and we're looking to deliver our data from our phase two asset and still have a cash runway to um, establish the next steps. So I think the message is clinical data coming and a good cash position, if you want the short summary. So here we have, um, I'm told, we have some MRSA in somebody's nose. So this is, this is the sort of the, the staph aureus tends to be always a sort of a football or a tennis ball type structure. So here you sit it inside the nose. And a third of the world is a carrier of staph aureus in the nose. So a third of this room is, is a carrier in the nose of, of staph aureus. So you have it, have it all over its armpits, groins, but the nose is a, a key component um, in terms of where it can jump in causing hospital infections. I'll point out that I stand here now with probably, depending where you read, 30 to 50 billion bugs on me, in me. Um, all of us are, of course, um, 
wearing and uh, with insiders, of course, who have, have bacteria. And uh, when they um, cause infections, of course, that, that normal stable situation can lead to uh, some very serious consequences. But one of the problems with anti-infectious antibiotics is that uh, it's seen, as, as uh, Martin didn't refer to earlier, it's not seen by pharma as one of the hot sectors. Despite uh, penicillin and other new mechanisms that were discovered sort of 60s, even into the 70s, there hasn't really been a new novel mechanism for an antibiotic, anti-infective, so depending who you talk to, talk to 30, 40 years. Um, also, um, they are, of course, the older mechanisms are cheap, generic, so pharma companies are reluctant to go into a space where they see low pricing and perhaps lack of novelty, and they have gradually moved out of this space. Now, this goes against the constant news of the challenge, the global problem of antimicrobial resistance, where I was at Cambridge on Friday with Dame Sally Davis yet again talking about this Armageddon that will face us in uh, 20, 30 years due to the rise of AMR. Um, you have more chance of dying of the infection rather than uh, perhaps your, or your cancer or other disease because of the problem with the increasing lack of effectiveness, effectiveness of existing antibiotics. So this AMR challenge is important and novel drugs that come into this space need to address it, and we do. We have clear differentiation with our XF platform that it doesn't lead to the same levels of resistance. It's very difficult for us to say you will never see resistance because these are superbugs for a reason. They are incredibly adaptable. Other challenges that uh, anti-infectives face, including some of the companies that have brought forward um, sort of reformulations and, and re revisited old formulations, is use in the community, where again you can have abuse and you have more widespread use, which can lead to uh, resistance. Our products, especially our lead asset, are focused very much on the hospital use, where especially in the USA, you are then part of, part of the hospital reimbursement bundle. And there are other advantages as well in terms of our approach is we believe it's low cost, we have a good route of manufacture. So we're not looking to be a high-priced, multi-thousand dollar product. We believe we can compete very effectively against what are the few current drugs used in this space with our, with our lead asset. And as I said, what we're looking to do here is reduce uh, the problems caused by people who are carriers, carriers in the nose of Staph aureus. So I said a third of us carry Staph in, in, in the nose. Um, and you have a, a much greater chance then of having a post-surgical infection. This is a well-established fact. Across the world, it's best practice going into a hospital procedure to be screened, tested, and a nasal swab is taken, put in a PCR machine, you're either a carrier or you're clear. If you're a carrier, you should then have a treatment to decolonize, which ranges from perhaps an antiseptic wipe, which is a limited efficacy. There is one drug that was approved from GSK many years ago, called mupiracin, which is a classical dermal antibiotic with resistance problems. And uh, there are no new drugs in development, and there is nothing approved in the USA. So we have the potential to be the first approved drug in this space in the States. And driven again by the number of patient operations, you can see it builds up to, a, we believe, a significant market opportunity. I don't want to dwell too much on grisly photos, but you can see here uh, the problems that can happen with serious infections. This is rare, but again, if you are a carrier in the nose, you have a 10 times greater chance of a post-surgical infection. And of course, the problems that can cause for patient recovery, costs, etc., uh, can range from you know, extra few days and more drugs, as opposed to some very, very serious infections, and of course, potentially, in the very worst cases, life-threatening. So our lead drug, XF73, addresses a clear market need. There is no approved drug in the USA, although it is recommended, as we're finding out now with our clinical study in US hospitals, we're actually talking to hospitals across the USA and we're finding out exactly what's going on in those hospitals, which is on top of our previous market research, uh, and doctors are looking to decolonize. They screen to see if a patient is a carrier and they're looking to de decolonize, but they don't really have an effective treatment. This has been acknowledged by the FDA, who have given our XF73 drug uh, QIDP status, which means a couple of years ago they reviewed uh, the existing data and qualifying the infectious disease product status means that it gets uh, extra five years market exclusivity and we have fast track status. So again, we think we have a validation there from the FDA and we're very confident we have a clear medical need for what we're looking to do with our lead asset. And indeed the existing drug which is used, mupiracin, again an old GSK antibiotic which has done very well but perhaps we believe seen its time, it has problems with resistance, um, you have to give it for five days before hospital treatments whereas ours is one day. We seem, see some clear advantages for our XF73 nasal gel compared to mupiracin which again mupiracin is not approved in the USA, it is approved, is approved in, in Europe and used in Europe and Japan and other countries. So we can go head to head with mupiracin. 
One of the key features of our drug is its lack or of resistance compared to classical antibiotics. Is the red button the light? Is that the light? Okay. Well, anyway, what's happening here, this is a selection of Petri dishes uh, where you start day one with your Staph aureus in this case, or in this case, MRSA is growing there. You apply your antibiotic, or in this case as well, our drug, XF73. And of course, you're, in all cases, you're killing the vast majority of the bacteria. You never kill all of them. The ones that aren't killed are potentially becoming resistant. So you take those, you grow them up again, and then you try and kill them again, and you measure the quantity of drug needed to kill them. And what happens over time, after three or four exposures, all of the older antibiotics begin to fail. So you go north on the charts, and you have to give increasing volumes of your antibiotic to achieve effectively an effective kill rate. What you see here, after 55 exposures along the bottom, the blue dots there are XF73. And this is a class attribute whereby over exposed, um, multiple exposures to XF73, you don't see resistance. So we would never make the claim, you will never see resistance, but it clearly differentiates us from uh, other antibiotics. And we've test done this with uh, a number of the compounds in our portfolio and also tested uh, in, in similar models against a variety of antibiotics. And we always beat them. And we believe this is the longest ever published passage data. So a key component of uh, the uniqueness of the XF73 approach. And as I said at the start, we believe this is key to any new anti-effective. You have to address antimicrobial resistance. This is uh, clinical data, which is really the, 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 was, the, was the data which was reported in 2016, which was the trigger for the IPO. So this data, uh, this was a study that was paid for and carried out by the US government, their infectious disease division. Effectively, the left three hand bars are placebo. So this is people who are carriers in the nose, uh, they're given a gel, this is the inert gel, and then they're measured over time, the number of bacteria. And on the right, you see uh, the gel, the same gel with our active XF73. And the black horizontal line basically is the hospital measure. Above the line, you're a carrier. Below, below the line, you're clear. And what you can see is, compared to placebo, you have a very uh, uh, marked effect, bearing in mind, these are log scales, Martin, that you have a very marked effect of reduction of the number of bacteria in the nose using XF73 compared to placebo. You always have a placebo effect, because if we pick or blow our noses, we lose bacteria. Uh, we're looking to repeat this now in the phase two, which is uh, uh, underway. So if we, uh, if we replicate that data in a phase two study, the only difference being this is volunteers who are carriers in the nose, our clinical study is people who are carriers in the nose who are going in for, for operations. So we will uh, look forward to that study uh, reporting. This is, um, I think, it's over 250 data points from subjects. Bear in mind these are volunteers, albeit all of our volunteers have always been nasal carriers. So we've obviously shown that the drug is very safe. Its class is a non-irritant. Um, and, of course, we've established the dose and, and refined the gel. So we have a very, uh, we have a very well-developed formulation. And you'll see here at the bottom, we're looking to, um, when it, the final product will be a very easy sort of break-off plastic nozzle, which you'd squirt in your nose, and that's the dose, which is better than the current uh, alternatives of wipes or, or, or tubes, which, with it, tubes with inexact dosing. Uh, the phase two is ongoing. Um, obviously, post-phase two, we can have discussions with the FDA under our QIDP regarding phase threes, and potentially we can be uh, looking for US registrations in 22-23. As always, with timelines in drug development, Take care. We, we, you know, we have to be very careful putting it up there. There are often delays, drug development re review processes, but these are, these are, these are reasonable estimates. Um, and obviously, we'll be pushing ahead um, and, uh, and doing our best to, to, to meet those timelines. But the key thing, of course, in the next six months is delivering the phase, phase two data. Uh, and this is a slide which summarises the study. As ever, drug development, incredibly complicated. And also, manufacturing and formulation is complicated. This business is, is very difficult. It is harder than rocket science. Um, and just coming back to the XF platform, um, we do have a pipeline. Our first two assets are clinical. We've talked about the nasal program in phase two. We have a phase one asset we're looking to build up to phase two of internet, uh, in 2020, which is targeting infections in, in leg ulcers, diabetic foot ulcers. Again, this is using the same compound in a different formulation. This is a large market. And then we have earlier assets in the discovery phase. We're looking at ocular, respiratory, uh, and small dermal applications, especially in biofilms. And biofilms are where bacteria hide away in a sort of polysaccharide layers. Very common in dentistry. So a lot of um, uh, dental infections of uh, a com biofilm component I I is involved there. And you also see that we have, and this is important in this space, where pharma are perhaps not investing as much as they should be in anti-effectives, but you get a lot of support from governments. Uh, US is... is 
but we'll put multi-million investments into, into company programs. You'll see Summit Therapeutics has a $60 million funding from BADA. We have partnerships which are funded um, by uh, the MBIC in the UK and also Innovate, but also with our China connection, and we have a partner for our portfolio, China Medical Systems in Shenzhen. Um, we also have a partnership with, N, uh, with Tianjin University where we've won a grant, which is, I think, circa about, depending on currencies, about one and a half million to fund work. So obviously that's going into the discovery space, not clinical development, but I think it does show we have a pipeline, albeit the value inflection for the short term is very much around our, our phase two asset. Dermal infections, diabetic foot ulcers, leg ulcers um, uh, are an important area. Um, unfortunately, again, um, people who are not necessarily, it's not linked to nasal carriage at all, this is linked to nasal carriage, it's just linked to the fact that these infections, these wounds, can get infected very easily by first colonizers, colonizers again, such as Staph aureus. We have a, a package there which we're, we're working on and we're hoping to bring that forward through to phase two in sort of 2020, 2021. Um, and our research projects I've discussed. China Medical Systems shows that we can do deals, so we did that around the IPO, and as we deliver data from the phase two, we'll be looking to sign more partnerships, um, hopefully in the US and other territories. Uh, our strategy is to seek partnerships. We are not looking to build a sales and marketing uh, force, so again, we have to uh, build packages that, that can be passed on onto pharma. In our case, it's more likely to be specialty pharma rather than the big pharma guys, because there's really only Merck, perhaps GSK and Roche, who play in this space, but even then, they're probably perhaps most of them bringing to look at vaccines rather than actually classical uh, small molecule anti-infectives. So um, prevention is better than cure. We have some exciting clinical data coming uh, you know, within a year, within, hopefully within six months. Uh, we're funded to deliver that, and we have uh, an earlier pipeline. And I believe our lead asset really has a clear clinical need. The more we are out there carrying out the study, talking to hospitals, we know that doctors want this drug. So our challenge is to convert that medical need uh, into a clear commercial opportunity, but we're confident we can do that because we can make this relatively cheaply and uh, we believe it uh, will be an exciting uh, year for us next year as we deliver that data. Thank you. Thank you. Neil Clark. <laughs> okay, we'll okay, so questions for Neil Clark. Uh, yes, one over the, the front here. Thanks, Neil. Um, I'm just wondering if, if you take one of these one of your products or the ones that have come before for this decolonization, if you know, if you, if you have this bacteria on you, um, is that in advance of every single medical procedure that person has or can you have effectively have one application of it then be cured of what might make you vulnerable in the first place? What, what you're looking to do with the nose is I'm going in for my cardiac operation tomorrow, the day before today, I would have one dose in the morning, one in the evening, same again for the day of surgery, and maybe one, one the day after. So I'm looking to decolonize my nose for the period of risk. And the period of risk basically is when I'm cut open because the bacteria is opportunistic and will jump. At the same time, you would have armpit washes with chlorhexidine and be washed. But what will happen after that, hopefully you recover and you will recolonize because your normal state is to be a carrier of staph in the nose. So if I was to unfortunately have another operation in six months' time, I'd probably go through exactly the same procedure. So there are markets actually for regular weekly decolonizations where perhaps if you're a known carrier, people might every week, once a week, have a try and reduce the carriage in their nose. But we're targeting very much people who are going in for serious operations. So these are the more invasive procedures, cardiac, orthopedic, um, cesareans, orth yeah, knees, hips, knees, that type of surgery. Uh, there's one at the back there and one at the front here. Would you want to go for front, uh, first? front first and then the back? Uh, here we are, Blue Chef. Thank, uh, thank you. Very interesting presentation. I'm new to your company, but I was just checking the IPO price, 157 versus current share price. Could you just tell us what happened during that journey and why we is had, the share price so low? Yeah, we had um, some, well, the company's 20 years old, so there were some private shareholders who sold out in the early days, which the, you know, the market was, was bad, but we just drifted down. And then last uh, two, three weeks ago, we had Garraway basically dump their stake and they picked that up from City Financial, which went into administration. So that was, you know, that was uh, not a managed sale. They just sold it to Winterflood. So that was unfortunate for us, but uh, we'll, we'll move on from that. But it's, yeah, I mean, if you look at the way we've tracked the general market, I'm afraid I think we've followed down a lot of AIM stocks and the anti-infective <coughs> grouping as well. So, uh, yes, it's been a tough time in terms of share price. And you said you have cash till 2020, early 21. 
uh, providing that you will get through the phase two, how much more cash do you need for phase three? Well, it depends if we do the study or, or a partner does it. But if it, the, f the phase three potentially could be into sort of the t 20 to 30 million bracket, whereas the current phase two in terms of uh, total funding is probably nearer sort of just getting towards 10. So yes, definitely you, you move up in terms of some bigger numbers, albeit it doesn't get close to sort of the, the two billion that was, that was talked about earlier. So what is, I, I know this sounds perhaps a naive question, but what is the breakthrough point when you would either decide to refund or, or sort of s sell where you are on to another company? Because obviously AIM investors are always impatient. They want that moment when, um, well, when everything's coming right. Inflection point, obviously, will be phase two data. Having said that, of course... Uh, you know, as people aren't silly in terms of, as Martin said, looking for, for when refinances might happen, then people may wait then for us to refinance to, to then look at uh, uh, in terms of the smaller investor coming in. But obviously, it, it, it's, it's a cash consuming business, so it's, it's difficult. And I think, I mean, talking generally, it's, it's, it's difficult to find examples in, in the UK biotech market mm -hmm. where people break out. The normal end game is you get taken mm -hmm. out, you get acquired, because there isn't in AIM, in London AIM at the moment, there isn't, isn't the appetite for investing in, in drug mm -hmm. development companies. And very quickly, because we've got another question here. Why the focus on the FDA and the US? Well, is that the, always the way that you go for the US? Well, it's the biggest market, first? but also for. Um, for the lead indication, as I said, that the sort of the comparator drug, mepiracin, is not approved in the USA, so there's no approved drug. So this is much easier than your mm. clinical trials are against placebo, but also if you do get approved, you are the gold standard. Now, with, we will come back to Europe because mepiracin yes. is approved, but it's much easier when there is no approved drug to, to take your... I'm not even going to ask you about the UK if we're in or out of Brexit, but uh, there's a question in the middle here. Didn't we have a question? Somebody here? Yes, there we are. Uh, yeah, I just want to follow up both of these gentlemen's questions, actually. So, yeah, certainly I recognise the market size is bigger in the US. Why are you doing your phase one and phase two studies in the US rather than here in Europe? And also to follow up this gentleman's question, as he you said, you're, uh, you're looking at the prophylaxis indication for pre-surgery, whereas this is far less profitable than a, uh, a treatment indication for uh, infection of some sort. Is there something in the TOX data or otherwise that has led you to concentrate on that indication? Well, secondly, no, there's, there's no, nothing wrong with the TOX data, and it's, there's, no, there's no difference in the profits between a prophylactic approach driven by tens of millions in operations or, or a chronic use. There's I would have thought there is. There's money to be made in both markets. I, I agree, but, I, I, the, but the post, pre, pre, pre surgery is certainly a smaller indication, a smaller market size than is antibiotic continuous. Well, daily doses I, I, to treat I disagree, and we've got the analysis. And then your, your other point, I can't remember, sorry, what was your other point regarding... Uh, why you're performing your phase one, your taste. Well, we're phase doing two a phase two, two and it's in USA and Europe. And okay. the phase ones have been in Europe and USA, and the reason we're focusing on the US, as I said, is because there's no approved drug there. So it's, uh, and we have the QID support from the FDA, so it's pushing against an open door. Europe is a fragmented market. It's a very poor place to do clinical studies uh, generally, so we're quite happy to be focused on the US. Europe's, oh, okay, thank you. Just bring in Dr. Martin Hall. Any, any sort of thoughts about what we've been hearing? Well, I'm... I'm, I'm converted in that uh, I agree that there's... I agree with Neil. There is very little um, interest from Big Pharma in antibiotics. And, but it, I'm aware of another company up in Cambridge with an interesting new technology. And it has struggled for... 10, 12 years to get any form of funding to do a clinical trial. So Neil's in a much stronger position in that he's on the market, he's got the funding through to a critical point. If those data are positive, I would expect his telephone to be ringing quite a lot. And we have a China partner. So we have China Medical Systems, have 3,000 3, sales reps in China. Dr. Wai Pen is their international director and ex-fund manager in the city. Healthcare, you will know Wai yeah. Zheng. So we have a built-in connection, also different places to go potentially for funding in terms of a corporate investor. So, and also that validation, somebody who's looked at all of our data and market sizes. So uh, it's tough out there in terms of share price, but we're quite confident where we are. I've been doing this for over 20 years, and we're fortunate we have very clear assets, little competition, and we're funded to del deliver some key data. We're in the biotech, and that's Christmas, to be honest. So we'll plough on and uh, look forward to further success. Okay, well, stunned everybody into silence. Thank you very much indeed.